leaving my house to take my wife out for our anniversary dinner. We just left the driveway, and there was a buck standing one yard over. And I said, we got to go back. There's a deer out there, and I still got my license that I haven't used. <laughs> of course, I laughed, but we kept going. I didn't stop for that. But more than likely, he would have been gone by the time everything got arranged and everything. But, it, you know, it's just funny to say something like that to your wife when you're taking her out on your anniversary for dinner. Oh, we're going to have to go back. There's a deer out there, right? It was pretty funny. My wife looked at me for a second and I just smiled. <laughs> I didn't even slow down. I wasn't going back. Uh, but we are excited about what the Lord has for our lives and uh, how He can use us if we'll stay available and ready to be used. I have a message I'm going to preach this morning. I've preached it twice in my life. I believe it's a very, it's a study that I did when I was a young man, and I really, really, I've just put a lot of thought into it. In this message, if you want to know what I believe about what the Bible teaches on salvation, I will reveal it to you in this message. As well as, if you don't know exactly what you believe, or you know what you believe and it is contrary to the word of God, this should clear some things up. The book of John. The book of John, chapter 14. Uh, I may, I don't know if I'll be able to get through this message completely. Uh, there are so many verses. And the thing is, Bible verses back up Bible verses back up Bible verses. Okay? I, I'm, I like to use the Word of God because if it speaks for itself, you'll get more out of it. John chapter 14, starting in verse number 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the word of God. May we rightly divide the word of truth. May we understand clearly what the Bible teaches, so that if we're here today without Jesus Christ, we can make that decision. If we know Jesus Christ, we'll be clear in what we believe that the Bible teaches. And if somebody asks us, we'll be ready to give an answer of the hope that life within us because of the Word of God and what it teaches. In your name I pray. Amen. Jesus was speaking to the disciples here. And he said this phrase, verse 4, Whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. He said, you know the way to heaven. It's been clear from the beginning the way to heaven. Hasn't changed. You know how to get there. And the disciples said, uh, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? We don't know. We don't know where you're going. And, and how do we know the way? Jesus said, you know it. The reality is we know the way to heaven. The world knows the way to heaven. You go to nations that have not known an English-speaking individual who has had the Bible, or anyone in their language that has had the Bible, they've never had the Bible in their language, and they know about God. Tribes that have been visited for the first time by outsiders have Bible stories. Literal Bible stories. How do they know them? How do they know them? Well, every one of them has Bible stories up to the point of the Tower of Babel. That's when the world was divided. So all of them have a history and a testimony of the Tower of Babel, Noah's Ark, and anything that happened before that. 
They have that in their history because they know it. Before the world was scattered, they have those stories. And it amazes National Geographic to find that these people know this stuff. It amazes them. How do they know about a worldwide flood when National Geographic doesn't even believe it happened? If these people that have never been met by outsiders before already have those stories because their ancestors were there. Jesus told the disciples, you know the way where I'm going. I want to present to you the three ways to heaven. Let's look at one more passage. The book of Luke. Chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm just going to reveal a question that was asked of Jesus. A question that is on the hearts and minds of many, even today. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. It says, And a certain ruler asked him, talking to Jesus, asked Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How can you and I have eternal life? The question was asked of Jesus then. People want to know today. The disciples, even that had traveled with Jesus. Now, they had not been, this, it was not the end of Jesus' ministry when they asked him that. But they, they still had some confusion going on. And they asked, how do we know the way? So I'm going to present to you the three ways to heaven. Romans chapter 5. I've got a lot of scripture. And so that's why this message may take a little bit of time to get through. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Every man is a sinner. Every man is going to die because of their sin. Now let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The very first part of that says, For the wages of sin is death. Well, everybody's a sinner. Everybody's going to die. It's very clear. So, the question, how are we going to be able to inherit eternal life? How can, they're, they're trying right now, constantly. You have, I don't know how many groups out there right now are trying to come up with genetic makeup changes to the human body so that you will live, literally they said, forever. They think one day they may create a gene that can help you live forever. As a matter of fact, they went into the study of, I think it was the black olive. And how it hardly ever deteriorates or molds or rot, it'll shrivel a little bit, but it just for years, this, the black olive can just exist. And so they're trying to figure out how they can turn a human into like a black olive so we can last longer. I don't want to live my life looking like a black olive, for one, in a red, round, ball up shape and not be able to do anything. That's just, but that's one of the ways oh, the olive exists in, in an amazing way all by itself. Let's study that and see if we can engineer that into the genetic makeup of the human. They're, they're trying crazy, crazy things to genetically alter the human for our own personal eternal life here on this earth. Which I don't think I would want in the first place. Let's look at Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. The Bible says in Psalm 51, verse 5, David is very clear from birth. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It all started out at the very beginning. He was a sinner. His mom was a sinner. He came from a sinful genetic makeup. David is very clear. We're all sinners. We're all going to die. So the question still remains. Where 
are you talking about? You said there's three ways. Where are you going with this? You gotta figure out how to get there. The question is, how do I inherit eternal life? We can go over and over through scripture. Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Verse number 8. This is about the fearful and unbelieving. We can stop those two and not have to finish it. It says, And the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody's going to die. All sinners, when they die, have a place in a lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. One chapter back, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. When I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Sounds painful. Sounds like torture. Doesn't sound pleasant at all. The death and punishment for a sinner who dies. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Yeah. All right, Steve. Where are you going with this? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse number seven. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Verse number 9 says, We shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Everlasting, permanent, never ending destruction. One more passage I want to go to an Old Testament passage, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Verse number 1. Daniel 12, 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame. And everlasting content. The first way I would present to you was you pay for your sins and you can go to heaven. How do I pay for my sins? Easily. Very simple. Just live out eternity in a place of destruction. And when eternity is over, you're done paying for it. You get to go to heaven. You get that? You survive eternity in hell 
and destruction for your sins, then you can go to heaven after that. There's no end to eternity. There's no end to it. If you can get to the end of it, you get to go to heaven. Doesn't sound like a pleasant way to try to get to heaven, does it? How many people are so pleased with their sin that they're willing to suffer the consequences hoping that in eternity God will just overlook it? I don't know how many people I've talked to who actually will look you in the eye and say, God loves people. He would never send anybody to hell. And I present to them, no, the Bible teaches that you send yourself to hell because of your sin. God doesn't send you there. You send yourself there. Now, he gives his angels the opportunity to give you a little boost there. But you're well on your way because of your sin. And my sin, that's where we spend eternity. Because of our sin. Try it out. You want that method? People say there's more than one way to get to heaven. And I'll present to you there's three. Finish out eternity in hell. And you'll get to go to heaven. Go ahead. Not going to happen. But people have tried it. My, my dad told me there was one, one day. He asked a man where he was going to spend eternity. And a man said, I'm going to be in hell partying with my friends. The word hell is not a cuss word. It's used as one many times. People have no clue anything about what hell really is. It gives me an opportunity when people use foul language to witness. It, it gives me the opportunity. When they use the word hell in a sentence, it gives me the opportunity to tell them, you really don't know what you're talking about. It's just a figure of speech. No, it's a literal place. It's a literal place. And our sin is going to send us there. Your sin will send you there. My sin will send me there. The Bible says literally every single person that walks on the face of this earth has their own place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's there already waiting for you because of your sin. reality is, you and I should be wanting to leave a vacant place in hell. Nothing wrong with having two houses, is there? Just don't have to live in one of them. I want to leave a vacancy down there. It's already there for me because I'm a sinner. Not going to live vacant. Never show up. Let's look at the next one. To get to heaven. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is the significant way of most religion. Right here. The significant way of most religion. Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> verse number 19. Or let's look at verse 18. It says, Ver Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jaw or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was very clear to tell them, you have to be righteous. More righteous than the Pharisees to go to heaven. More righteous than the Pharisees to go to heaven. Righteousness is a works thing. It is. Righteousness is works. He told them, your works 
have to be greater than their works to get to heaven. There is a form of works of salvation in the Bible. Hear me out clearly. Let's get to it. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I've heard so many religions talk about working your way to heaven. I wanted to study what the Bible teaches about it. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which swallow, strain at a nap and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. They say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. He told them very clearly, you are so much into your works and doing things, you'll pay a tithe even of your seasonings. <clears throat> Honestly, if I were to get a, a, a little thing of salt, and I were to bring it to you, and I were to give you a little container of salt, would you take that salt and measure it out and bring a tithe of it back to the church? Honestly? Go to a neighbor's house. Hey, I'm out of sugar. Can I borrow a cup of sugar? You need to, you need to borrow a cup and a 10% of sugar because you got if you're not going to return it, because you just made a profit off your neighbor, you got to get 10% of that sugar to the church. Did you realize how nitpicky these Pharisees were? So detailed about every little bitty thing. Jesus said, you got to outdo them. Go ahead, outdo the Pharisee, and you can go to heaven. The thing is, you can't outdo a Pharisee in external matters. They're so detail-oriented about every little thing. You can't outdo them. And Jesus is very clear here how wonderful they were at trying to clean the outside with works. And he said this, your works have to exceed theirs to be able to get to heaven. Try it. Try living a life to outdo the Pharisees. I'm not done. I have more Bible. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. There are some things I could spend so much time in these passages here right now. Luke chapter 18. Verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I get tithes of all that I possess. You figure, and just look at the heart of this man in his own prayer time, just telling God, Lord, you know how well I've done with my life. There's nobody out there that can compare to me. Nobody. You know how well I've done. Look at me. You know, 
When somebody walks up to you with a confidence like that and tells you, I outdo you in everything, where do you even start an argument with them? Where? You think about it, in any significant field out there, in work, you get the guy at the top of the class in everything. And you meet up with him and he's like, I can do anything. I've done it all. Go ahead, compare yourself to me. Oh, you might think that you got to be in one or two little areas when you start realizing that this guy really does know his stuff and he lives it. Go ahead. Jesus said, beat the Pharisee at his own game. Outdo the Pharisee. Can I ask you something? Just in the simple thing of tithing, are we honestly as strict as the Pharisees are? I'd say, I'm not. I really would have to say, we tithe of our finances to the Lord, to the church, to the work of the ministry. But I think a lot of times that's where we end up with our tithe is just in finances. We don't tithe of anything else, our time, or anything. We just, that's it. I actually started doing something. Um, people, I haven't haven't shot a deer, but I've got two deer this year from people that hunted, and they offered it to me, and I was very grateful and accepted it. Well, I told my wife, I said, this is a blessing to us, so we need to tie it off our deer. So we, I mean, it, it's not something that I would just tell everybody, you know, if you don't do it this way, you're going to, I'm not like that. I'm like, you know, it's been such a blessing to us. And uh, I said, so let's let's get some of each of the deer, take it to our preacher, give it to him and his wife. They like deer, and uh, it's good to eat. So that's what we did. Just, but, okay, so I've tithed of my finances, and I've tithed of two deer. Um, I'm nothing like the Pharisees. I, that's pretty much about most of what I've been tithing of my time, some of it. I probably haven't given God enough of it to equal what would be considered a tithe. I don't know. May, I haven't really counted it out exactly. But the reality is we're not like the Pharisees. We're not so strict that we follow every detail of life. He says, beat them at their own game and you get to go. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse number 37. It says, and as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. This Pharisee asked Jesus, come eat with me. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Oh, have you ever sat down to a meal without washing your hands? Ever? Pharisee's got to beat again. I tell you what, you work out on a farm... And they bring the lunch out to you in the field. There ain't always water to wash your hands in. The water that's out there, probably you don't want to wash them in anyway. You just grab what you got and eat it. Oh, you can't do that. You've got to go back to the house and wash your hands. Pharisee marveled. It amazed him. Did you, did you see that Jesus sat down to eat without washing his That guy's got problems. That's what the Pharisee did. We can go on and on. Your righteousness has to exceed theirs. The difference is, and let me take you back really briefly to Matthew 23. I'm going to show you something in there because this is going to transition into our third way. You want to work your way to heaven? Beat the Pharisees at their own game. Outdo the Pharisees. Physically, you can not. They wrote the rules. They added things to the Bible that weren't even there, made them laws, and lived out more. You can't beat the Pharisees. They write the rules. 
Let's look at Matthew chapter 23, verse number 25. Jesus says, Woe unto you, Pharisees, or woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. Talking about their lifestyle, their physical life. He says, you're cleaning up your outside, your works. But within there, full of extortion and excess. You're a sinner inside, he said still. How do you beat the Pharisee? You've got to get more than the outside clean. Verse 26 is very clear. Thou, blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the bladder, that the outside of it may be clean also. You're trying to clean the outside, but the outside is getting filthier every day because the inside is filthy and it's just overflowing into the outside. You want to beat the Pharisees? Clean the inside first. How do you do that? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but from His mercy. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. It is noon. I'm going to try to get done within about seven or eight minutes here. Shut it down. But I want you to see this. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. The Bible says... Much more, or let's look at verse 8. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than. Being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We are justified, we are cleansed, we are washed pure only by the blood of Jesus Christ. You want to, you want to try to pay for your own sin in a place called hell? Try it. When eternity is over, you get to go to heaven. You want to try to work it out here on this earth? you got to beat the Pharisees. They write the rules. Try to beat them. You won't. Because their righteousness is complete. Covering the outside. You can't beat them. The only way to beat a Pharisee is through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse number 15. The Bible says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, that's Adam's sin, the offense, many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Verse 17 is very clear. For by one man... Talking about Adam again. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. You want the gift of, you, you want eternal life? It's through grace, the gift of God, eternal life in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Anything that is works at all is trying to play the Pharisee game. You can't beat them, so you can't win it, so therefore you don't get eternal life. The Pharisees, the Bible, Jesus was clear. Your righteousness has to exceed theirs. So therefore, what was he saying? Theirs was not even good enough. I don't know how many religions out there that I've listened to and studied and paid attention to that, that will, are very, they are thorough. In telling you that you must receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and do good works. And they'll add those good works in there. What they're trying to do is they're trying to pay, take the way that God has set to go to a place called heaven through Jesus Christ, through the grace of Jesus Christ, through his own shed blood on the cross, and they're trying to add the Pharisees in with Jesus and say, let's just meet, meet these two roads. <laughs> they don't meet. They don't meet. There's no pharisaical way to get to heaven. Jesus was very clear on that. Their way is all external. It doesn't match up. But if you could be them, there was only one. One. Perfect. Human being. No, there was two. Ever created. 
this earth. That many. Now, Jesus Christ made himself a man, but his creation, he made two perfect human beings who sinned. And after that, we all have that sin nature. And because of that, the inside of our vessel is dirty. No matter how much we try to clean the outside, it's not going to fix the inside. You'll never beat the Pharisees. Romans chapter 10. Some of these verses you've probably heard before. Go over them. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich in all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Cut and dry, very clear, nothing added to it. Trusting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone as your Savior is salvation the way to get to heaven. You can try the other two ways. They will end in failure. Because you cannot complete. This way, you can't complete it either. Jesus Christ completed it on the cross. You cannot get to heaven. Jesus said, you know the way. What was he telling those disciples when he said, you know the way? He was telling those disciples, you personally know the way. Two verses later, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, you know the way. We, what are you talking about? We know the way. Jesus said, you know me. I'm the way. What do we look at? Very simple. Same question. And I'm going to finish with this story. The book of Acts. Chapter 16. The book of Acts, chapter 16. Say, Steve, do you believe if I uh, spend eternity in a place called hell, I can go to heaven? Not really. Because you can't complete eternity. Do you really believe that I could work my way to heaven? Not really, because you can't outdo the Pharisees. They are roads, but they're dead end roads. Acts chapter 16, verse 30, the Bible says. Let me, let me go back a few verses, because this looks like it's starting in the middle of a, a, a passage. I want to get some clarity. Verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How do I receive salvation, that eternal life that everyone else is asking about? Very clearly. Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. You must believe on Jesus Christ. Those members of your house must believe on Jesus Christ. And when you believe on Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life, you get to go to heaven. If you're putting your faith and trust in a God that is just going to overlook your sin and just say, oh, I love them too much. Their sin is not so bad. They get to go to heaven. You're wrong. God does not overlook sin. Technically, God doesn't even look on sin. God the Father himself. He has nothing to do with it. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, became sin for us, which... Is overwhelming in and of itself that Jesus would do that for you. God the Father doesn't even look on sin. He doesn't even look at his own son on the cross. He turned his back on his own son. If God's going to, people think God's going to overlook their sin, just, oh, your sin's not as bad as somebody else's. No, 
Your sin has to be paid for. It has to be. In order to do that, there's a place called heaven. So I'm going to work it out here, and I'm going to get it paid for here. I dare you. I beg you. I, I could say, let's just take it to court and show me, prove to me that you've never eaten a meal in your life without washing your hands. That's just one thing. One Pharisee thing. That's not even the whole list of how many hundreds of things and laws they had. That's just one. Show me that you've done that. I'll say, you're pretty neat. Come over to my house and watch a bunch of kids eat. They hardly ever wash their hands. They just come in. <laughs> they do sometimes. Especially if they've been out in the dirt. But the reality is, you can't beat the Pharisees. Jesus Christ made the only true way to go to heaven by dying on a cross. If you're trying to take what the Bible teaches about Jesus dying on a cross for your sins so that you can trust in Him and go to a place called heaven, if you're trying to take that and add your works to it, you're trying to mix a dead end road with a road to get to heaven, and there's something, there's going to be a crash there. It does not mean, it does not match up. You can't add works to Jesus Christ. That is not salvation. Through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Trusting Him as your Savior. I'm going to end with that. If you bow your head and close your eyes with me. I want you to think about what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross for your sin and for mine. If you've never come to the realization that it's Jesus Christ and Him alone. Nothing added to Him. Nothing taken away. It's only Christ. Say, so I've been a good person. Thank you, but you did not beat the Pharisees. Say, God, God will weigh my good and my bad. Yes, He will, and the bad always wins out, and you will have to pay for it. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, today would be a good day. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, take the Word of God, the clarity that it has, the answers and the testimony that it has, and share them with those that you know that are seeking an answer that are so confused in religion. They want to add everything to Jesus Christ. Show them what the scriptures say. Show them that if you want to work it out, beat the Pharisees. You can't. You've got to do it through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Let's stand up. Let Jonathan play the piano. Open the invitation. May the Lord deal with you as He sees fit. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, come on up and I'll talk to you. I'll show you with the Word of God. Again, I'll show you some more verses. How the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you and me.
share with somebody else. Worse, maybe even give you comfort and assurance of what he did in your heart and life. Let's pray. Ask my brother to close us in prayer. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for all the scriptures that we heard today. And I pray to God that we do uh, take to heart and continue to take to heart each day how important our salvation is and what you've done for us and how our important our salvation is and how important salvation is for other those around us that never heard or that have heard and are still questioning how they can know for sure they're going to come. I pray to God that we will uh, go out this week and uh, be able to give that clear answer of how others can know for sure they're on the way to heaven. Thank you so much for down the cross to save us, but you would help each and every one here to go home and to have a, a great and wonderful week, great and wonderful end of the year and uh, celebration time here, God, as we continue to reflect back on you and what you've done for us and the fact that you came to this earth. Amen.